I was so tickled at the prospect of listening to effectively a podcast and then from out of nowhere you just hear ah, exterminate, exterminate. <laughs> and welcome back to another episode of Who is My Doctor? Hey, Zach, who is my doctor? Who is indeed? I am your host, Zach, and I know a lot about Doctor Who. I am also your host, Cassie, and I know nothing about Doctor Who. Well, today you're going to learn about one episode more, uh, Series 1, Episode 11, Boomtown. Boom Tomb. <laughs> Boomhower Town. <laughs> Boom Town. <laughs> this town ain't... Boom, boom, boom enough for the two of us. <laughs> boom, boom, boom town. It's boom, 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 boom town. Okay. We're milking this joke for way too long. <laughs> You're milking it. My joke was flawless. <laughs> and this is also the return of your favorite alien species, the Slitheen. Oh, hooray. I love that. <laughs> love seeing favorites return. <laughs> So let's just address those two things then, uh, as part of the Cassie Perfassi today. Uh, why do you think it might be called Boomtown? I don't know. I'm always wrong, and at this point, You're I'm not always running, wrong. I'm You're at like a running 40... total of nine times I've been correct out of twenty guesses. Do you know the kind of psychological harm that does to only be right forty percent of the time? Forty-five. Do you know how that feels, though, to be right only 40 fucking 5% of the time? Well, there's only one way to fix that, Cassie, and that's by guessing oh, more things. Oh, my goodness. Can I please get some kind of little, um, just like a little treat? Well, maybe, little maybe treat, we can... A uh, little hint. I mean, well, why do you think, what do you think the Slovene might do? My God. Because uh, I've already given you... They've come back to torment me personally. <laughs> that's why they're back. Well, maybe let's look at that instead. We'll come back to the name. Uh, uh, is there anything you think that they could do to turn this lead around for you? Oh, no. They have, they have a possible arc? I'm just curious. I, this is this is more about keeping no, you honest. because I hate them. You hate I hate them. everything about them. They're stupid little squishy faces. They're farts. Fair. There's nothing. There's absolutely nothing that they could do unless one of them shape changes into... A, some kind of like pale elf vampire gentleman <laughs> unless one further unzips the giant Slave Slavine suit to reveal they're a starian from Baldur's Gate yeah if if Neil Newbin pops out of one then I'll be okay <laughs> Which good. I know he's not going to, because I looked at his IMDb just to make sure that he didn't make some <laughs> kind of appearance. And this is not a bit. I did this earnestly. Oh, that's why I'm laughing so hard. I know that is in no way a bit. Uh, well, because he's in the British. <laughs> he's in the British. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the famous country British. Yeah, he's on that big ol' island. <laughs> I right. assumed maybe. So, so we, uh, we... I know who's not in this episode. Yeah, we, we know we've established in, who's in not in it. every episode after this, I know who 100% is not in it. At least not credited. Yeah, you never or, know. Or at least not yet. We Because the show's still going. So who knows what'll happen. I mean, that, that boy's in video games. I highly doubt... <laughs> Unless they never throw know. every Baldur's geek a fucking bone, which, <laughs> you know, they might. Um, all right, but we've we've decided that, no, there is no way a Slovene could be turned around no. for you. Um, so I'm going to hold you to that, just to, because obviously... Is that I, one of the professes? Is that the... Yes. Okay, is, so is I the, can... Is the, I can fight this one. Yes, I am going to... I'm going to let you choose to keep yourself honest, and you can tell me... If you think that the that if that if this particular race ha becomes, uh, I'm, I don't want to say improved because improvement from zero is not very impressive, but has turned around on you uh, in a significant enough manner. But so I'm going to keep you honest. So you need to keep it yourself honest. On do, that they, one. do they have anything to do with cats? 
Because uh, that could change it. Not to my knowledge. Okay, so no. Um, this Unless is, they pull- This is also, I think, the last time they show up in the entire... Okay, so I have no hope. Yeah, the it's, it's, it's either this will turn around for you or nothing else, because the only... The only other time they show up is in a spin-off show called The Sarah Jane Adventures, which we'll get to that later. But th- as far as I'm aware, they don't show up again. At least not really. They might there might be like a background one somewhere, but they're not a feature character anymore after this episode. So, um, if you remember last time, the Slovene were trying to start World War Three. By trying to <laughs> burn the world. Yeah, basically. Have everybody use their nukes. So if I had to guess, Boomtown has something to do with a nuclear bomb. Okay. So you, so uh, Boomtown is specifically about blowing something up again with a nuclear bomb. Yes. Okay. So you put those two pins in there in these for them. Uh, that will be the two Cassie Profassies here today. I'm keeping it simple. Something's going to blow up. Something's going to blow up. Something's going to blow up. That's <laughs> what I'm writing down. I'm keeping it vague. Right, so Let me have this one, Something please. Something going to blow up. Something going to blow up. Or at least up. the plan is for something to blow up. And Cassie will still hate the Slovene by the end of this episode. Oh, my God. I guarantee you. I am, like, not even on record. I'm halfway tempted to keep a time lapse rolling of me this whole time <laughs> just to keep myself honest. <laughs> A time lapse? How? Like we strap? Like, like we strap I, you I, to like, a? I'll keep my. I'll like record myself the whole time. <laughs> I just like we strap you to a. What's that? A truth detect? What's the lie detector test? Sure. We, <laughs> we just strap you to one of those. The one it, that Vanity Fair uses. Yeah, we just strap you one of those. But instead of tracking your truths and your lies, it just tracks your feelings towards the Slovene. <laughs> yes, that is exactly how those machines work. No it's doubt. It's our Slovene about machine. It. <laughs> Alrighty, well, we will find out if Cassie is still raging against the Slovene after this episode, Boomtown. That's such a sick bit, dude. <laughs> Job well done. I like that joke. <laughs> This episode of Who Is My Doctor is brought to you by The Cube. What is The Cube, you ask? Why, heck if I know. It just showed up on my door one day. I threw it away immediately, but it keeps coming back. It follows me. Into every room. In my car. At work. It even follows me on Blue Sky. Who gave this thing an invite code? Now it's told me the only way to rid myself of it is to give it to someone else. So please, someone, anyone, take The Cube. Free me from these shackles. Relieve my mind of the torture that... It's gone. One of you took it. It must be following one of you now. Oh, thank you. And with my newfound freedom, I will gift you... The rest of the episode. Hooray! Hooray, indeed. She's an egg. 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 Second chances. Yeah, a lot of, uh, I guess, nature versus nurture is sort of the question it leaves you with. It doesn't really explore that much in the episode itself, but... uh... It does, it does have sort of an interesting, like, here's what we'll do with her now. Well, because there, there's that, and there's also the question of, like, the morality of execution. Yeah. And death sentence, which, because this was 2005, I might need to look up something really Yeah, quick. I mean, I don't know specifically but, what the UK's relationship to the death penalty is. Fair, 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 fair. Because um, I, I know there were a couple plays written in the early 2000s, Amer- like Mer- American plays, American plays um, that do delve real deep into that and about the, like, you know, is it okay? Yeah, I mean, question <laughs> mark. There is, I mean, there is sort of an interesting point where she's taught where sh- she's talking about how, you know, I was willing to kill, and now you're willing to kill. How are we any different? And I feel like the really obvious answer is mine is like this is in reaction to you 
This is not a proactive exterminate human life for my personal benefit. Well, that too. And she didn't purposefully seek anybody out to kill aside from the people that happened to waltz into her office and threaten her overall plan. Yeah. She did not hunt anybody necessarily. And even the Slitheen as a whole were not targeting individuals. They were targeting groups of people. And yeah, they were they were committing entire, genocide. Yeah. Entire countries. Yeah, so it's there's a whole like level of scale to it that she or she was intentionally obfuscating to make the our well, heroes feel bad. The the other part of that too is the fact that she stresses for a lot of the episode her humanness. Yeah. And how much she's grown fond of her humanness. And it's left unclear the entire episode how honest that was being. Well, cuz there is a part I think that part of it is genuinely true because she does let Kathy Salt live after hearing about her husband and their unborn child. Yeah. And so and that's that happens before any doctor interaction. So I think that there is genuinely a part of Margaret or Blonde whichever name. Yeah. There is a part of her that genuinely does have some moral compass that yeah. is erring on the side of doing good. Yeah, but even then the doctor also points out that every now and then a little victim's spared because she smiled, because he's got freckles, because they begged. And that's how you live with yourself. That's how you slaughter millions. Because once in a while, on a whim, if the wind's in the right direction, you happen to be kind. But uh, just to give you your profacy points here, while it was not necessarily a nuclear explosion or a nuclear bomb, it I was a nuclear... I did say something going to blow up. Yeah, and I, and I feel like nuclear bomb to nuclear power plant is close enough. I'll still give you that point. Something blew in, though, because we did see the heart of the TARDIS. The, the heart of the TARDIS. The heart of the TARDIS. Yar, the heart of the TARDIS. Um, <laughs> that is all I could hear. Um, and and I was correct. She did nothing to assuage my opinion. Because there was a half second where I went, oh man, she can change. And that was the point I was going to make, is that she talks about how she can change. She is capable of changing. Never once does she say, I am. And like I have changed. I mean, she does. She does say I have changed, but the doctor blows it off by pointing out the the thing I said a second ago about. Well, yeah, uh, you have, and it is very clear that it is not an overwhelming change. Yeah, it is, or it's even possibly a lie, considering that the end of the episode, you know, she points out that the TARDIS exploding is apparently her fault. Yeah, I do like though how how her story ends. I do like that she's an egg. She's an egg. She's an egg. She gets a second chance because her whole deal was based off of that the Slitheen, which is not her species, it is her specific family, mm -hmm. are killers. And that she was born into a family and trained to kill and had to take her first life when she was 13. What 13 translates into human years? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, but... I imagine that 13 is very young for her species. So just to clarify my question earlier, because I feel like the way it may have come across is I meant you have to like that character positively. I more meant, do you think they are a better villain now? No. No? Okay. Absolutely not. They're still <laughs> stupid. All right. <laughs> They're farty and just no. There is still some of those core principles, like they still have to introduce her with her stomach growling. They it's thankfully the... only do it a couple times. This episode is not like a recurring well, thing as the much. Well, one thing I will say that I like is that she does use it as an advantage yeah. when she is trying to take Miss Kathy Salt and, you know, kill her. Because she says, oof, my stomach, like, we're going to have to stop by the bathroom. Yeah. Which there is a part of me that was like, all right, we're, we're weaponizing your fartiness. Like, <laughs> Fantastic! Yeah, this it, is this is the fart of war. It just it made more practical sense, and it didn't feel like it was used as a comedic tool. It was something where it's like <laughs> they didn't mention again the 
gas exchange. Yeah. So if you didn't see the first two-parter, then you missed that. But mm -hmm. yeah, overall opinions still not. They're still changed. not great. Okay. No. So in this case, uh, you get because the full two not, points. Because they're not even convincing in their... Like, uh, there is no reason for them to want to do what they want to do for yeah. anything more than greed. Yeah. And I don't... I'm not somebody who really... Responds to that. No, I, I... Greed is horrible, and I just... We've seen it before in this show, too, yeah. where greed is not met with awards it's met with you know tragedy and yeah it it is yeah i i mean i i sort of agree with that i don't particularly like them even after this like this is a, this is a good strong showing for a single character but for the most part there's it, it felt a little too cartoonish now i i agree yeah <laughs> I also, though, something that I did really like about this episode is that we did get a callback from uh, 1869. Yeah, we got a... They they were telling the story of, of the Cardiff Rift that opened in, in episode three, uh, where the TARDIS can just, like, plop itself right on top of that rift and open up and suck up the the rift-like fuel. Uh, I I really liked that as a callback. I, cause and also... I don't, we haven't uh, seen I don't, that before. I also really liked... There wasn't... A t I, I can't think of other times this has happened this might have happened and I'm just blanking on it they were telling a lot of stories about things that we didn't get to see yeah which as somebody with severe FOMO it does make me a little sad <laughs> hearing stories of things that happened that I didn't get to see but it felt very much um, like the title sequences for Rick and Morty where yeah. they show some things that are in episodes but they also show you little clips of things that aren't full episodes and also a and lot so of, some of the things that they're talking about just are not full episodes mm -hmm. worth and also a lot of those stories they tell do get used as like the basis for uh, for like the peripheral media uh doctor who also has uh, like i've mentioned before the audio dramas but there's also uh novels there's also comic books um there's a whole like set of peripheral media that comes out uh that is can, that is a, a little like Star Wars in that it's canon until it isn't. Mm. Um, like you can totally accept this stuff exactly as canon as you want it to be, until something in the show disproves that canon or like wipes it out. Okay. Because sometimes you know the show will adapt those books, comics, audio dramas into into episodes, and so they sort of become self conflicting by the fact that one has a different Doctor doing the same story. It, it, it's those nice little touches that sort of expand the story beyond the scope of the show and give other writers, you know, things to chew on. Something else I liked seeing and we don't, we haven't been able to see a lot of it just because it has been Rose and the Doctor. But when Captain Jack Harkness and Mickey join Rose and Doctor in the TARDIS and they're all just joking having a laugh yeah it really seems like jack rose and the doctor are like really in sync especially especially since the doctor and captain jack joke with each other and they understand each other's sarcasm yeah which is it was so cute and like also i forgot about captain jack harkness at the top of the episode so when he came on i was immediately <laughs> taken aback <laughs> No starring, but I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, they they really want you to rem to remind you that he's there because he's the, like the second. Fa like you get the opening stinger, and then Mickey walks up to the TARDIS, and then it's Jack is the one who says hi. But Jack is is and isn't in this episode because he spends a lot of his time alone in the TARDIS. Yeah, he spends a lot of it under the hood of the TARDIS, doing being a mechanic Dude, boy. Doing crust stuff. He's just doing mechanical car stuff. Not with his shirt off, but his shirt is awfully tight. <laughs> yeah, that's uh and John Barrowman's pants were doing his butt some favors in that in that episode too. Mm. Um it, it's nice seeing them working especially because part of the episode was also about Mickey dealing with his There there were very distinct A plot and B plot, which yeah. We do see a little bit of it here, but it isn't it's as... It's not as pronounced as it is in this episode. That and these felt like two very different A plot, B plot. Yeah. typically, like, the episode that comes to mind specifically is um, 
one with fucking Adam. <laughs> but everything that they're doing in Satellite 5, mm-hmm. everything that they're doing independently of each other all feed in and filter into the one like big meta narrative, mm-hmm. which is Simon Pegg and the Zip Monster. <laughs> he's an accomplished comedic actor, and he's made of pus. Simon Pegg and the Zit Monster. Coming this fall to TBS. You done? Yeah, and I made myself laugh. I'm good. Anyways, uh, this time the, the two plots did feel very independent of each other, and it, it was nice. Yeah. It's not just that they're independent of each other, it's that the B plot is feeding into the larger arc of the season, of or of the, the show. It has everything to do with the whole premise of the show. Yeah. In Rose running away with the doctor and leaving her friends and family behind. And what a great acting moment for Mickey when he's just like... I mean, it's a nice little uh, almost bait and switch where he's like, why don't we go get a hotel together for the night if you're going to be here all night anyway? And he's like, actually, I'm seeing someone now. Um, Well, it's a bait and switch because also, like, he even says that he can't move on from anybody because he gets the phone call from Rose and he just keeps coming back. Yeah. And Rose doesn't particularly seem to help assuage that fear. Even like that was, it doesn't even seem like that was her intention. It seems more like she just feels bad that she made him feel bad. Yeah. She's sad. He's sad. And you know, at the end of the episode, is genuinely upset yeah. that Mickey isn't there because at the top of the episode you see the four of them laughing and having an awesome time all together. And by this point now she or by the end she comes back and she's deflated and upset and you know that the captain Jack and the doctor seem fine but they're yeah, also the, the just the tardis boyfriends. Yeah. The the tardy boys. The tardy boys. <laughs> That's pretty good. I don't want to spoil it for myself, but I did write down another pre profacy which Mm -hmm. I will keep to myself, maybe. I'm I'm debating. I mean, you you could tell me in that There is a part of me that does that because this particular episode being the penultimate to the season finale, for Mm -hmm. lack of a better term. Yeah. We see a lot of talk about second chances. And we especially see Rose having that talk, having that moment of she's an egg, she gets a second chance, really hit her. So I do think that despite having had this time with the doctor, she is going to request to go back from the moment that she left to basically do over. Interesting. Yeah, that's that is my profacy for my pre profacy Okay. Since she's very upset that she hurt Mickey, and one of the only ways that you can fix that upset is by just going back. Yeah, I mean... Because her timeline's fucked. Yeah, she, well, she also, she also kind of can't go back to any... In the, in the rules they've set up, she can't really go back to any time sooner than the one we just left. Because she'd be overlapping her own timeline. Mm. Um, and Time Lords can sort of do it, but there's a catch to it. Humans are, it's way finny here for humans. Well, because we did see that in uh, Father's Day. Yeah. But I, I do think that the ending of the season will have everything to do with Rose getting a second chance. One really nice moment that I think we, or I think really nice sequence might be a better way of putting it, is when the doctor first shows up to the mayor's uh, office. And he's just like, hi, I'm here to see the mayor. And then her response is to run out the window. That is very good. Uh, there was one moment in, in that in particular that I really enjoyed uh, that really shows their the like level of adventure the three uh, companions are here. Uh, where they're all chasing in different directions to try and get the slit to try and like corner um, Blonde or Margaret. Uh, and so Jack does it by like doing a huge leap over people like a like a track stars leap over people rose sort of like deftly dodges through some women who are holding up some papers and then mickey fully crashes into a janitor's cart (laughs) 
Well, first he runs one way, and then he has to circle back and run in the opposite direction. He's just a little confused. Yeah, he's he's so ill-equipped compared to Rose and Jack, because Rose and Jack have done this for a long time. And I, I think it's a really great moment of, like, they've been telling us about the adventures they've gone on, but that's a really nice, like, here's, here's showing you what the results of those adventures have done to these people. Yes. Mickey has not gone on these adventures, so he gets bucket foot. And this time, Rose was fast enough. That's true. Uh, I also really liked the the teleportation gag. Yes. Where she would run away and then he would fish her right back. And every time he fished Margaret back, she was a little, a little bit closer. closer. Yeah. That was my, that was the part that did it because that was definitive for her that she, there's no way she can win because every time she disappears, she's a little bit closer. Yeah. It's a little bit worse every time she does it. And then we find out that her plan is, we. I, it's weird that she put the surfboard in the plan in the plan landscape. I don't know why. She in her tried. Springfield model, yeah. In, in yeah her model what's up of Springfield, with that? yeah. Uh, but she she put she for some reason puts her, uh, the her her plan is to blow up Cardiff. Blow up Cardiff and then ride away on a time wave. Yeah, because Cardiff is sitting on top of the rift, and so that when the rift explodes, it'll push away through the galaxy she says surfs up at one point yeah, what the it. fuck <laughs> i feel like maybe you would have turned around on them if she hadn't said surfs up oh my god no i wouldn't have because she she hits me first with the fucking springfield model which i what is this a building for ants a building for simpsons <laughs> that's exactly what it looks like the building from a looks like a like a like a springfield version of that model from zoolander You've never seen Zoolander, I've so seen I can't the, even that scene. give you the credit of saying, ha ha, <laughs> yeah, so true, so accurate. The surfboard is simultaneously... The, the, the joke, though, for me, or the thing that tickles me, is the idea that she was going to be near that model <laughs> the whole time. Yeah, she, she had no intentions on leaving that model alone. <laughs> just walk away with it. I'm just taking it home for posterity. I was going to paint it when I get home. <laughs> I'm using it for D&D &D later. I do, while the surfboard itself is kind of silly, I do like the general idea that they imply that she can't have made that. She got it from somewhere, but we don't know where. And they never explain where she gets it from. No, she just keeps referring to the TARDIS as scrap metal. So my intuition says that she has salvaged it from some other planet that she blew up. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, I've always just like, that's a really fun little detail that just like, there's something here that isn't important enough to tell you because we don't really need to know where it came from. We just need to know that it's there. But it just it just adds to the universe a little bit more. Uh, speaking of adding to the universe, Jack Harkness has bondage gear with him. Mm, you don't say. <laughs> He's got handcuffs that if you get further than 10 feet from someone zap you to be fair that's not necessarily bondage gear it does make for a fun evening i imagine i do think that it genuinely though is like prison gear because it's i mean he was a thief so he may have uh i i think that that's it yeah or he had a dog that he didn't want to <laughs> going too far get, away from get away from that squirrel <laughs> he, 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 he walks like in the opposite direction <laughs> exactly. of the dog. Exactly. <laughs> I do like that she called it bondage dinner. That's yeah. the only dinner positive. Dinner and bondage. Because yeah, you really feel like that actress is of a particular, like, has a particular role she's usually cast in. Which so is this one. Maybe. I mean, but it's just like, she, she doesn't know. I'm assuming that she as an actress does not get to talk about bondage much normally. Fair. So she really chews that line. In a way, it's like, this is the only time I'm ever going to get to say this line. This is the only time ever in my whole acting career will I get to say the word bondage. <laughs> exactly. And and say it in a positive light. Because she's sort of doing the two, I would assume, the two things she could get normally roles for, which is politician and villain. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was, I, I, thought, I honestly thought she was doing really well the whole episode. I thought she was... Really acting her heart out. Yeah, she had a couple of really awesome actor moments. Yeah. Uh, like dinner and bondage. And the back and forth between her and Christopher Eccleston at the dinner. The closer the camera got, yeah. the farther away from the TV I got. 
<laughs> but yeah, it starts with the like, po- like just very simply like poisoning a drink. Doctor, the doctor's just like, no one bets with a Gallifreyan when death is on the line. I did like the the different variants of her trying to poison the doctor first with first by very classical like Shakespearean means, yeah, and then with the finger dart. <laughs> And then with her poison breath. And he's just, like, ready for it every time. I love that. They never get their food, though, before before they get the he food. He doesn't get his steak he and chips. He doesn't get his steak and chips. How how mean is that? Um. Oh, Bad Wolf. Oh, yeah. Uh, the the project that she has is called uh, Blyde... Pro- I might pronounce this wrong. It's Welsh, but it's Blyde Drug, which from Welsh translates to Bad Wolf. Which uh, we've seen scribbled on the TARDIS, we've seen scribbled on posters. Yeah, and... um, yeah. the word bad wolf shows up in most stories this season. And the doctor is just like, that's very weird, it's following us. And he's like, oh no, never mind. It's probably just like when you hear a word for the first time and you hear it and then you hear it all the time. But Th- I... Does that get any kind of payoff? Well, I will tell you, uh, we'll find out next time because the next episode is called Bad Wolf. <gasps> oh. And we'll watch that next time. On who is my doctor? Who is my doctor? Who is indeed? Goodbye. we can say goodbye to the Slovene, and soon we'll say goodbye to this season of the show, because next time we're looking at the two-part finale and our 10th episode. I'm excited to hit that milestone, and I hope you are too. Please give us a like or five stars or whatever your podcast platform of choice asks. Share us around to your friends or on social media if you think other people would like the show, and you can follow us on social media as well. We're on Twitter, Blue Sky Threads, and Instagram at WindyPod. That's W-I-M-D-P-O-D. I hope you all have a good week and I will see you next Tuesday because your Tuesdays are now Whose Days.